Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the EIG's fourth in a series of webinars on solving mass merchandisers' challenges for retail manufacturers and distributors. With our guest panelists, John Cosgrove from Atlantic Handling Systems and Danny Kaplan from SMC Data. We appreciate that you're taking your time to join us today on how to build an evolving resilient enterprise as well as support EIG's over 50 uh, webinars. We really appreciate the time that you're here today. Uh, we hope that your family are healthy and safe. Uh, today, we're, we're in the series of webinars. We're on the fourth of the series. We had a webinar one, was Unleashing the Power of the ERP Software Modernization. Webinar two, Optimizing Cold Storage uh, Inventory. And then we got into Cold Chain challenges and now we're getting into mass merchandising and then next we'll get into simplifying uh, warehouse operations. All these webinars can be found on the EIG website and you can of course contact John or Danny anytime for uh, the latest. Um, again, uh, we uh, appreciate you joining today and we encourage you to enter your questions into the chat and participate in the poll EV Word Cloud questions. My name is Jim DeVries. I'm president and founder of Enhance International Group. I'll be the host of today's webinar. And we also have Tim Kirsch behind the scenes here. Thank you, Tim. He's president of Independence Marketing Systems and Solutions. And he'll be helping us in the chat. So please do uh, ask questions. We'll get to all your questions uh, throughout the webinar. Uh, with that, a few words of introduction, Danny. I'm I'm Danny Kaplan. My background is consulting. In '85, I made them executives. In my in my '80s and '90s, I've done 50 million on a handshake. For the past 25 years, I'm representing VAI, which is supply chain software, enterprise software manufacturers, distribution, and food. Perfect, Danny. Thank you, John. I'm John Cosgrove. I'm the president and founder of Atlantic Handling Systems, which is a leading solution provider in the material handling industry. Um, I have uh, some various things. I've also uh, served as a government official. I've served five consecutive terms as the mayor of Fairlawn, New Jersey, and I was also the fire chief in Fairlawn before I was the mayor. Thanks, Mayor. Appreciate it. Uh... With that, uh, just a background of myself, I've trained as an engineer, mechanical, electrical, nuclear engineer. I've done a lot of work over many different mediums from R&D to operations. And uh, my latest love, of course, is supply chains for the last 20, 25 plus years. With that, we'll get into the deliverables to today's webinar, which are first, uh, the challenges of integrating it with mass merchandisers. And then we'll get into uh, how to optimize your plant layout and automation for mass merchandises. How do you set your, your uh, factory and or warehouse for success? Uh, number three is how do you embrace that warehouse technology? Uh, and then unleashing the power of a unified database, the VAI engine behind the scenes. And then... Finally, we'll get into some case studies. So with that, John, some background of Atlantic Handling Systems. Yes, Atlantic Handling Systems, we're a 20-year-old um, material handling and storage system integrator. Uh, we are a division of a company called Mayberry Material Handling, which is a 45-year-old uh, company up in Massachusetts. They are the crown fork truck distributor in Western Mass and uh, Connecticut, which uh, the two of our companies combined make us one of the largest material handling providers in uh, the Northeast. And we are systems integrators and we like to pride ourselves on that. We do engineering up front and we provide solutions to some complex material handling problems. We have a CAD design team for building layouts. Um, we represent many fine equipment manufacturers. We have conveyor service and maintenance. We custom design and manufacture our own mezzanines with experienced installation crews. And we help and we work with Danny Kaplan and VAI to uh, present an affordable warehouse management system that we can integrate with, which provides our customers a, a 
a great deal of uh, solutions to the problems that they have. We also help in obtaining the hard to obtain today permits from the cities and towns throughout the, our area. Thanks, John. And Danny? It's not my video. Sorry. <clears throat> I represent VAI, supply chain enterprise software, manufacture distribution in food, and include warehouse management. Would that translate to a distributor can buy a manufacturer, a manufacturer can buy a distributor, and a food client can be both a distributor and, and manufacturer. It has a real-time warehouse software management, which is a very important issue because if you have a standalone warehouse management and then the standalone ERP software, the integration issue is broken lean and create inventory issues. It's a one-stop shopping. Include the IBM Cognos Analytics that tell you real-time information, your inventory level, what the customer buys, when he buys, who to buys, and how much to buy. Thanks, Danny. And with that, a little background on Enhanced International Group. And EIG is a group of passionate experts uh, to guide your transformation. We have over 50 consultants, consulting companies, and SaaS providers like John and Danny. And EIG serves as the mass integrator uh, for all of the partners to provide you that end solution. Today, of course, we're focusing on uh, our, our vision is to focus directly on mass merchandiser ecosystem. And, and that's where we're going to be focusing our efforts today. And uh, we always emphasize that, a, that we need to have a strongly linked strategy to execution plan. And that's what we're talking about today is how do we get uh, your strategy to support your mass merchandisers uh, from uh, a plan and, and, and to actually execute with the VAI software, and of course, the, the engine behind it on the ground, the automation, which John will cover to meet those requirements of these mass merchandisers, which is very high volume, very quick uh, delivery. And with that, uh, we'll get to our agenda here on the challenges of integrating with mass merchandisers. Then we'll get into the optimizing that facility layout with John and uh, that integration with uh, VAI. Then we'll talk about the power of S2K uh, on unleashing the power of the database uh, for with the VAI system to bring that visibility up in front of you. And then some case studies, some really uh, interesting case studies on how this is all brought together. With that, we'll get into the challenges and we'll throw out this uh, question out here and we'll uh, We'll return at the end of this uh, section on what are your warehouse challenges. Uh, we see erratic demand, cost, expiration, wastage, uh, probably chargebacks. Uh, we'll get back into this uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but first, let's talk about mass merchandisers. Let's make sure we're all on the same page. This is uh, direct from Investopedia. Uh, uh, you know, the mass merchandisers have changed over the time. At one time, it was the big box stores more, uh, the five and dime, and now it's turned into the Costco's and the uh, Targets and Sam's Club and Best Buys. And of course, Amazon upset everything when they came up with their e-retailers. But of course, your local supermarket and drugstores are also in this mass retailers. So who are they? Well, the big ones are in the U.S. are Walmart, Amazon, Costco, Kroger, and so forth. So these are the folks that. Uh, how do we supply to them uh, in a in a manner that meets their requirements? And again, this comes from the National Research Foundation. Uh, John, any thoughts on this? Yes, you know, as you said before, you know, Amazon has uh, revolutionized the whole mass merchandise. Uh, uh, you know, scope that we look at today as far as uh, distribution. And uh, what's happened is, you know, uh, Walmart, all of these other large mass merchandisers have to compete and their customers are, you know, especially on the e-commerce side, they want uh, 
delivery tomorrow and they want it to be correct and on time. And uh, so they're, they're all, it has changed the world. And, you know, we talk about the mass merchandisers that we ship to the stores. And then some of our clients are actually doing fulfillment for these people. So they, they have to meet their standards. Yeah. And they're tough standards. Danny, your thoughts? It's a brand new reality called chargeback. If you deliver on the wrong time or the barcode label doesn't meet the requirements, you get penalized. You build $100,000, you get paid $80,000. It's a, cent, a profit center for the mass merchandiser. And you really have to be very diligent now with your EDI and the barcode label and all the requirements. Thanks, Danny. With that, we'll move on to the next slide. Just giving you, well, what's the growth rate from a compounded growth rate perspective uh, from now until, let's say, 2026? This comes from Statistica. And it shows uh, what, what kinds of compounded annual growth rates that we're seeing out there. Of course, the fashion and apparel is the biggest. Electricals, electronics, and leisure and entertainment are right up at the top. And then on the bottom there, you see food service and, and edible grocery uh, still growing at a good clip at that 4% uh, compounded annual growth rate. So uh, depending on which market you serve, uh, you'll you'll be seeing continued growth in these in these area. Uh, you see health and beauty at five point three percent, for example. So uh, you should be seeing that kind of growth if you're serving those markets. You should be seeing at least that much growth in your business in this next uh, five or so years. Uh, John, your thoughts? Yeah, I think what you see here is um, it shows a growth in a lot of industries, but also you know you can talk about some of the people that I have done business with, like Bed Bath and Beyond, who mm -hmm. couldn't, uh, you know, they were the mass merchandisers and had the stores, but th they just didn't get the e-commerce out the way that, uh, you know, Amazon might or, you know, some of the other e-commerce. And, and and it hurt them in the end because of the shift. And a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of women like to shop online now and uh, it, mm -hmm. it hurt. Absolutely. Danny, your thoughts? It's a brand new reality now where people went to the shopping mall and bought the shopping malls that buy on the internet now. So the e-commerce became a very big option now. And if you don't have an integrated e-commerce with your back office, your business will suffer. Amazon and the Walmart became a very big, very big uh, layer in the market. Yeah, and as, Danny, as you allude here, the e-commerce you know, that has grown dramatically over the last year. And you can see on the right side of this graph, the the ones that are more dependent on e-commerce and the ones that are less dependent. So uh, you can buy a car online today, but it's still a relatively new market. And as you, if you move to the right, you see the entertainment that more of the electronics are, are what's really moved on the internet. And there's still a lot of room to grow in, in these other uh, sectors. Well, I so, think that the graph you showed before, Jim, says it all. You know, Amazon doesn't have a brick and mortar uh, store. There, there right. isn't. But you see right. that they're at the top. So what, what's yeah. happened? You know, they're right behind Walmart. But Walmart has all this brick and mortar and, and is trying to do e-commerce also. But Amazon yep. is, is there, and they don't they don't have all that overhead on that, so they can spend it on on integration and systems, and you know they know they know how to get it done and ship your stuff quickly and on time. They've really defined the last mile, right? Amazon yeah. Yeah. redefined right to your doorstep and make it so easy that you don't even need to go to the store. It's you know it, it gets to the point where. You know, do you wait a week to go to the grocery store? Or you just order it and get it tomorrow on Amazon. It's hard right. to compete with. And, and that's certainly these guys, they need to keep the replenishment really high, right? And and the delivery, that's why they're on time and in full requirements. And that's why they have chargebacks is because if they don't have, if if they're delayed in shipping, they're competing with the stores, right? The Amazons and in the e-commerce. So they're competing. It's like go to the store or buy it online. But if you buy it online, it takes a week to get it. 
then I might as well just go to the store. But if I right. can buy it online and get it tomorrow, then I'm not going to go to the store. So it does affect. That's why it flows back into the OTIF uh, requirement. It flows back into the chargebacks and what they're charging you as a supplier, right? It flows right back into there. And also, and you know, the brick and mortar supermarkets are now more and more into e-commerce. Absolutely. You know, because of that. Absolutely. Danny, your thoughts? Yes, because of the e-commerce, you see a new phenomenon. The people, store like Macy's and Best, Best and Beyond, are closing the store because they cannot compete with the e-commerce now. People buy online rather than go to the store. And the COVID made a big change with people could not go could not go to the store. So that's why the e-commerce became so so popular. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the overall retail market is growing at about a 5.8% clip, everything. When you combine it, uh, $26 trillion business in retail up to 28 tr in the last two or three years. And they expect it to keep growing uh, at, at a, like a 6 to 7% globally. So uh, the retail market is still pretty healthy right now. Wow. Uh, and what what they expect to see, but it is the mix is changing dramatically, and the last mile is becoming uh, it's no longer a, a nice to have. It's a must be requirement for companies to be able to provide that. So we the brick and mortars are having a a challenge in which stores do they close, which which do they depend on e commerce, and it's pretty dynamic, and it's it's a challenge for them. So with that, just to put everything in context, you know, the supply chain, we start, we start with, uh, we, you know, we have raw materials coming into subcomponent manufacturers, but let's just start with the subcomponent manufacturers, which then provide the component manufacturers, then you get into your assembly plants, and then you get to your wholesalers and distributors. And you can see it's, it gets complicated very quickly. And the transportation to serve the end customer is is quite a challenge, and all the you know there there are a lot less uh, just uh, logistics service providers, and we all know the challenges with uh, logistics service providers uh, the, of getting folks in that realm. But then you have a lot of communication going across these, and you have different ways for these routes to expand. Uh, and all sorts of uh, if but wins that is now changing the way uh, companies operate. And, you know, do I make my brick and mortar a warehouse? Do I try to do it more upstream and, and then deliver straight to the door? All these types of challenges are what the retailers and our customers are trying to figure out. And then, of course, as a provider or a, a 3PL uh, DC, distributor it's it's tough to to figure out where how you play a big role in this and it is expanding but i would expect over the next year or two you're going to start seeing some uh contraction and consolidation in this area i think kim uh, you know i've seen a lot of growth in 3pls mm -hmm. because the retailers you know like someone like amazon they just can't fulfill all the order they don't have enough capacity to fulfill a lot of the order so there where it says wholesalers there it's going right to end the consumers yeah they think they're getting it from amazon but it's just 3pl yeah absolutely Which so is you have a lot of break bulk facilities now i mean most of this is right. uh you're breaking the bulk and you're shipping at the item level directly at the consumer level directly from a warehouse a dc or from a store that has a warehouse attached to it Right. You know, in front of three PLs, instead of picking cases, they're picking eaches now. Yeah. So it's quite complicated. Danny, your thoughts? Yes, it's becoming a situation now that the big, it be, that will use private label like stores. So you think you buy from Amazon, but you really get a shipping from a direct uh, other company. Absolutely. And if you have an issue, the Amazon tells you, we have to call the supplier and he will respond to you and then you will get the response. Yeah. Yeah. That is a challenge, isn't it? 
And, and, right. as a three, and as a 3PL, if you don't meet the um, retailer's uh, uh, criteria, that you get the chargebacks, and sooner or later, you lose them as an account. So you're beholden yeah. to, to, to adhere to what they send down to you. Absolutely. So we kind of summarized uh, the following challenges. We're going to start off with labor ch shortages and the urgent battle for talent. John, you want to kick us off on this one? Sure. Um, what's happening right now, and, and we just talked about a 3PL. I have a 3PL customer. Uh, he needs about 225 to 250 employees to fulfill what he has to do. But he has over 300 employees because of the labor shortage and the fact that people don't want to work five-day work weeks. And years ago, he would just fire the people who wouldn't do that, but he can't afford to do that today because he doesn't know. So the labor shortage is really something that's uh, that's that's hurting a lot of our people in the distribution side. Thanks. And now I'll, I'll give uh, Danny the second bullet here to make some comments on the rising costs of balancing the books amidst inflation. That's an issue because if you have large returns, you end up with excess inventory in the warehouse and become a, a, an issue of where you store it. So one option is having a retail module attached to uh, part of the software where you can sell it in the in the shopping malls. But either way, it, it becomes an issue of balancing the books with, inf with the inflation. Absolutely. Well said, Danny. And the next one, Omnichannel. John, you want to take that one? Yeah, I, you know... Um... What's happened is that uh, in retail, the, the whole world has changed. It's a tsunami now. You know, uh, e-commerce has, has changed the whole thing. And so we have different channels of distribution going out to the end customers. And, and it's something that, you know, cust clients have to manage carefully because if they don't, they're going to, um, you know, have to know what, what type orders they're going to ship, who they're going to ship to and what who they're going to have other people do it for them great comment and how about micro fulfillment or micro fulfillment to optimize the last mile danny your thoughts that's become a big issue the fulfillment and uh, then the shipping if you have prior to the call vet you told the vendor give me the best price ship it to the warehouse or distribution center the culvert turning apps upside down. Today is not a question of the best price, it is delivery. Because late delivery creates production disruption or the cancellation and excess warehouse in the warehouse. So shipping, it becomes a chain reaction of receiving and shipping. Absolutely. And what's interesting in the last mile is that contributes to 41% of the total supply chain cost now that we're shipping straight to the home at, at the package level. So a lot of challenges in that area. And John, increasing inventory reserves. I know you got some thoughts on this one. Yeah, what's, what's happened is, you know, during the uh, pandemic and the supply chain shortage, people began to bring in, you know, as much as Danny said before, excess inventory. And when you don't manage your inventory, of course, that's a profit and loss center. And uh, that's why um, when you use the software like Danny provides VAI, you know, you can you can regulate and you can anticipate the things with your inventory. And, you know, we can help to help you store more inventory in a smaller space or in the space you have instead of having to move and things like that. But, you know, increasing inventory reserves, it also affects you know, your revenue and, and so on and so forth. So it's it's a big problem. And if you can manage it carefully, it's going to really uh, give you a big ROI. Absolutely. Danny, any closing thoughts? Yes, excess inventory became a real issue. And uh, because people are scared of not getting inventory in time, they overstock it. But then it's a, the pendulum swing the other way. The warehouse is full, extra labor cost, and shipment issue. Mm -hmm. And absolutely. And then what also happens is you buy too much stuff and it goes, 
it expires, but it but you don't throw it out. You don't take the time to clean out your excess inventory, as you mentioned before, Danny. So you're trying to buy more, and all of a sudden your inventory is is just ballooning. And you you, you so managing your inventory proactively uh, is is vitally important here. Yeah, my, I've seen that as almost the death of certain companies. You know, these sure. um, family-owned companies that have been, you know, into the second generation. You know, the first generation is let's let's put it in the warehouse. We'll <laughs> sell it someday. And what it's really doing is it's taking up shelf space that you could put something in that would sell. And so yeah. you're, you're better off to, uh, you know, take a look at your inventory and get rid of what you you know what you don't what yeah. you don't think you can use. Well, that's why small businesses often get into real estate, isn't it? Because they're looking for another warehouse to put all right. their stuff. Right, exactly. Right. So you end up owning a lot of real estate to store your stuff that you don't ever use again. So, and in the gym should... equipment that uh, the owner's wife bought that, that she doesn't yeah. use, but we're going to use it someday. That, that's also up in the rack somewhere. Absolutely. It's all there. <laughs> another issue is having strong, strong analytic, what product are selling, who buys it, and how much to buy. Yeah. Otherwise, you end up buying the wrong products and the warehouse overstocked with inventory you cannot sell. Absolutely. Having a strong uh, engine like S2K to look at that supply demand and making sure you're buying what is in demand and really doing, uh, you have a very nice forecasting module in there, Danny, that can help make sure that you're buying the right right. Uh, things that are moving versus what you might think you want, need to buy. So excellent uh, discussion here. So we're getting into the challenges and solutions. So uh, John, why don't you kick us off here on worker shortage and order status? Yeah, um, on, the, on the worker shortage, you know, um, Danny always talks about this. You know, you can, if you use a smartphone to scan, it can increase picks per hours by 50%. And then, you know, if you're selling mass merchandisers, you got to be involved in EDI. You know, um, they require it, EDI and ASNs, a lot of them. But, uh, you know, the automatic transactions, let them know. So, um, you know, you have, to, you have to be involved in that. The worker shortage is real. If you take a look at what we have um, in the workforce right now, it's, there's a shortage. Now they're raising the minimum wage. It's all becoming more and more expensive. So we find a lot of people now turning to automation that, you know, they want to replace people. We talk about robotics, but in a lot of cases, you know, you have to have the right ROI for robotics and you have to, have, you know, I mean, it can be expensive, but there's a big payback. You know, I, I heard the other day that uh, certain robots in, in um, certain situations can do six times the amount of work, but you have to make sure because like any other technology or any other solution, if it's the wrong solution for you, if it's in the wrong place, it, it ends up where you uh, you could lose productivity. So that's what you have to do. And the order status, you know, the EDI and the uh, data exchange, that's more, Danny knows a lot of that. That's all comes out of, uh, you know, either uh, the VAI software or you can find someone independently to help you do that. And, uh, you know, there are companies that will help you do that when you're selling to mass merchandisers. And we'll get into that in a few minutes, the EI. So we'll probably hold off on that a bit. Any right. any other comments on any of these top three areas? Yes, the uh, worker soldiers create a big a big challenge with the RF gun, which require training. So the big turnaround around of worker soldiers, worker source shortage, you have to retrain them. Well, if you use a smartphone, require no training for everybody using a phone. And you have very good pickup pickers. So it's a one one way to lower your cost, both ways, by training and having cheaper equipment. Excellent. So we'll hit up on picking and packing uh some of the improvements there. Uh Danny, you want to continue talking about picking and packing a little bit? Before prior to COVID, you pick up the whole bulk of inventory and ship to the customer. Now, because we ship to the individual merchandise, you pick up pieces. So you have to be very accurate what you pick and whom you ship it to, which has become a catch-22. If you don't have the right equipment to do it, 
and the right analytic software, you end up shipping the wrong product to the wrong customer. Thanks, Danny. Any closing comments on this slide, John? Yeah, I just want to say, um, we're going to talk a little bit later about a pick module and uh, picking the eaches and cases, what to do separately. But this is where um, you really have to do the integration between the WMS that Danny provides and the integration that we provide with our controls for conveyors and uh, what we do to design the warehouse. So it's, it's very important and it's where your biggest ROI can come in. And, and uh, the packaging, dunnage, and the UCC 128 labels and print and apply. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later, but, you know, print and apply instead of having people put them on. I will tell you one, um, a uh, fragrance company that we did a job for, they would hire 30 temporary employees in August to start labeling boxes. And we put in a print and apply. They could do about 800 a day. We put in a print and apply system. We could do over 5,000 a day. And we've made sure, you know, you have to place the label in the spot that the mass merchandiser wants exactly. And we made sure with a photo eye, we would read it before we sent it to a sorter. If it wasn't in the right spot, we would send it down a reject lane and a supervisor could come over and make sure that they had, or if they had a no read on the barcode. So it's very, very important. And that's one of the big keys to stopping chargebacks. Nice. Thanks, John. And uh, we'll move on to the next slide here of some more challenges and solutions. Uh, John, you want to kick us off here? I think it's kind of... Yeah, it, it's kind of what we just talked about, about the chargebacks. What happens is, you know, you, you want to have verification on your side if there are chargebacks. So if you use the ERP, which is Danny and WMS, with our automation and controls, I can use an in-motion scale where we can weigh boxes on a fly and the WMS will tell us what the box should weigh for the contents that are in it. So if it's not right, we can send it down the reject lane, or if the barcode doesn't read right, we can do all of those things. And what that does is to help to eliminate chargebacks, because if they do try to charge it back, you can go back and show them, no, look, the box weighed exactly what it was supposed to. And uh, so that does that. And the sortation, what we do then is, we send the at the end, and we'll talk about this a little bit more after we send it through the scale and the barcode reader. We can send it to a high-speed sortation system and then live load trucks and, and vans. Nice. And then closing out this slide here, uh, Danny, you have some thoughts on any of these items here? Basically, the automated shipping via, via, via EDI that's a costly issue, the EDI, but if you, have, if you have large volume, you must do it. But if you have small volumes, there are other alternatives for it. Absolutely. And a question just came in on, a little bit backed up, it says, is there a way to determine how much of a reduction in labor costs will occur when automating and restructuring the warehouse? Yeah, uh, you know, what we what we do is we'll come in and, and take a look at how many people you're currently using and you can give us the numbers, how much that costs, and then we apply it to what we uh, think, how many people you will need and what the automation is. And then, you know, we usually find an ROI within a year to a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Nice. With that, we'll just keep moving. Uh, just looking at, again, what are some warehouse challenges, erratic demand, expiration. We talked about chargebacks. Any other uh, thoughts before we move to the next section? Okay, I think we'll focus on uh, getting into the optimizing the facility layout. And we'll get into what are the challenges for mass merchandisers. And John, why don't you kick us off here? Yeah, what I'm going to do now is give you a little description of operation of a system that we put in um, to bring in um, goods. If you look here, what we're doing is we're, we're loading a, uh, a narrow belt sorter. It can do 60 to 100 boxes per minute. These, these boxes are coming in right off a trailer and they're being received and they're put on a sorter. And then that sorter is an oval sorter and will go around and when it uh, the, reads the barcode, it's a bi-directional scanner will read it. It'll go down that lane 
and then it'll be palletized and put into the reserve stock. So you can go to the next slide, Jim. So this is just a drawing that shows what we're doing is we're going to take the product from racking and we're going to put it in. This is an overview of what we call three. There are three pick modules here. What a pick module is is full rack on both sides coming into the middle with a power conveyor with gravity on each side. And essentially what it is is it becomes a pick and pass or like a zone pick. So the operator will take a box and put a generic label on that box, which identifies it. It'll scan it and identify it as a license plate on that. And then they will pick their zone. And this particular system is pick to light. So when they scan the pick ticket, they get the lights to light up and they'll tell them to pick 10, to pick five, whatever it is, they'll pick it. And then it, they'll pass it down to the next person. If they're done and they're complete in the middle of the pick module and it doesn't have to go all the way around, They'll put it on the power conveyor and take it out. And the red spiral circular things are a spiral. So if you go to the next few slides, we'll be able to see some pictures of this actually. This is the, that's the pick module itself. It's a three level high pick module where this one is loaded from the back with an order picker, has flow racking and it comes to the middle, which you'll see. So, and then where you see the yellow gates, we actually can load pallets onto those gates and then take them and, and put them into the system also. So if you go to the drawing, we'll show you. There it is. There's the three levels of mezzanine plus the floor. And um, there's a, a catwalk in between the reserve stock. You see the picker who can pick the boxes and then load the flow rack. And it comes to the middle. And what, what they do, and this is a picture of it. What this company did was they they did sunglasses for um, Walmart at the time, Kmart, uh, you know, um, CVS, Walgreens. So what they would do is they would load each level and then pick it clean because these sunglasses all had individual tags on them for that um, mer for that mass merchandiser. So if you look to the left, you see a, a roll of barcodes. What they do is they take that barcode and they put it onto the box and there's a pick ticket in the box. They scan that, which then lights up the pick to light. And you can see they take it and they push it. They pick their zone and then they put it down and they keep pushing it down. And then when it's done, they put it on the middle conveyor, which takes it out. That's the spiral that you saw at the end. It just brings it down so it doesn't take up as much room and we can get a lot more accumulation in instead of taking up a lot of valuable real estate. So we had one at each end of these pick modules. When we come out, we can also do this. This is a pick module where we brought it out on all three levels and we brought it down. You'll see that there's a structure up above. This was built in Secaucus, New Jersey, which is built on a swamp. So we had to distribute the weight of the conveyor, which we did by building these structures and hanging the conveyor from that. So we're taking it there to the next slide. And, and um, when we get to the next slide, you see this is the transportation that comes out of that. We transport it and then we bring it out to a checker where they check it. And then we'll go to the next slide. And we're also in, we're weighing it on the fly there also. So this is another sorter, but this is at the end of the line where we're gonna send it to shipping. So what we do is it's an oval sh shipper comes down and we can, you can see that we have some 90 degree diverts and some 30 degree diverts. We send it down. We have a scanning tunnel at the end of each one of these to verify the barcode. And then what we do is we live load the truck. Uh, this particular live load, we had a, um, a max called max, a belt conveyor that can extend 40 feet into the truck and it can live load it. And we can also do it with the, you know, the accordion type um, best conveyor or Nestaflex conveyors that are gravity. You can do it that way also and live load the truck. If you look here, you'll see there, the green part of this slide, there are some robots on the line. Robots can be used in all of these situations. It's just a matter of cost. And if you're doing at the end of the line, um, you know, like Jiffy bags or clothing in bags, you know, there, there are, instead of having a sortation loop, 
you could have a robot at the end and the robot will take and put it, whether it's FedEx, UPS, you know, so on and so forth. We also um, have here a situation where we can also use a robotic palletizer at the end. If you're loading boxes and palletizing them, we can we can do that also and then ship put it into the container. So there's a lot of options, but of course, we have to take a look at the return on investment of all of them based on how many SKUs you have, how many you're shipping a day, and you know what your volume is, how many people you currently have. And when we take that and we add it all up together, we find out whether the ROI works for you. Thanks, John. With that, we're going to kind of change direction slightly here. We talked about advanced ship notices, uh, the electronic data interchange 856, which is the most common one uh, for high volume merchandise uh, that require advanced ship notices. And in this diagram, you start from the right, the buyer, the customer, they'll upload the purchase order uh, to the system through the server in the middle. And then down, and then you'll download that into your system. And then when you're ready to ship, you'll upload the shipment information and download it, the data to the buyer. And and so this is the most common way of interacting with your uh, supplier and uh, the between the supplier and the customer. In this case, a mass merchandiser. And again, these are the most common uh, types of transactions. You usually need a high volume for this to make sense. It is costly, it's not cheap, in the order of $20,000, $30,000 to set up an EDI connection. Many customers, uh, mass merchandisers require this and they require a minimum of this type of information on there. There may be even additional information that a, a mass merchandiser may require, but the tracking number, carrier information, BOL, all, everything you find on the bill of lading, the delivery, date and time, the order, details, pallets and units shipped uh, needs to be on there. And then there's, we talked about EDI, but there are also some alternatives in, in that uh, flat uh, file transfer from using uh, your portal or their portal and using a robotics process automation bot where you're scraping information off and you're automatically uh, doing it versus doing it in spreadsheets. Uh, of course, you can always do it with a Excel sheet and v VLOOKUP seems to be the answer to all problems, but there are uh, some automated solutions beyond using Excel. I don't know where we'd be without Excel <laughs> and things, but it's not really the most efficient way to do things and often leads to errors, processing errors. Uh, John, your thoughts on this? Well, you know, you see it a lot throughout the people who sell mass merchandisers. You know, the majority, this is this is what they do. They use ASNs with the EDI and, and uh, you know, it, it really, it works for them and it helps them. And I know that Danny is very familiar with that through all his years of experience in uh, selling the WMS and ERP systems. Danny, your thoughts? There is a question here, is the VAI capable of uh, easily uh, uh, optimize the system? VAI is very easily optimized, especially if you need the uh, uh, ASN and uh, dealing with the mass merchandise. There is few options, one use EDI and the other one use uh, other method, just transferring the file as a flat file and then they receive the other, but that flat file will be for small small volume. Right, and and to that answer that question may be better answered than this next slide where e, uh, VAI does offer two options where they get a third party to set up the the flat file and get that EDI link, and they use a uh, a partner called Infocon, so that's one thing that you can do. The second thing is uh, if the, if you already have an EDI in house. Uh, provider, you know, then VI will work with your provider and uh, and and uh, use uh, their service partner, uh, Clail Integration Cloud. So uh, I, th I think VAI has a lot of options here. And and so 
it's something that uh, is part of the part and parcel of of what they do every day and and uh and again the handshakes are so important completely integrated warehouse management system picking orders and cartons and contents uh to great create those ucc 128 labels that john mentioned and 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 danny mentioned you get your advanced ship notice documents when the when it's shipped and sends that edi 810 and and it's integrated throughout the whole system so the bottom line is VA has has the answer in this realm to meet your uh, requirements for your mass merchandisers. Danny, your closing thoughts on this? It's it's it, it's good to have two options because EDI is very expensive. So the smaller companies need some other options that uh, can afford. And having yeah. multiple options makes a big difference to the Companies who are like the mid market on 30, 40, 50 million dollar versus the high end market, which is 200, 300 million dollar. So, two different factor uh, sector of the market uh, that being able to afford, to afford dealing with the mar mass merchandise. Absolutely. With that, we're going to keep moving here. So, John's going to kick us off on this slide. Go ahead, John. Okay, so, um, you know, one of the things, real estate is very expensive today. So, uh, you know, I have a lot of clients that, that had 10-year leases and their leases are up. And, and when they look at the price to stay in their facility, even though they, they've grown, uh, they, they realize that uh, it's, it's just astronomical right now, some of the pricing for real estate. So what we try to do is come up with a high-density space utilization where we shorten up the aisles and get them to go to a different type of fork truck, possibly if it works for them. And uh, we go to some high density storage, whether it be pushback or pallet flow, that kind of thing. You know, for mass merchandisers, they when they bring the product in, they have to put it in rack for storage before they bring it into whatever the pick area might be. And, you know, this is a good time to talk about right now. Uh, you know, we used to oh, take the person and bring it to the goods and now what we're trying to do is bring the goods to the person. And, and that's what the uh, this whole robotic revolution, when you see these AGV, automatic guided vehicles, what they're actually doing is they're bringing the goods to the person as opposed to have the person serpentining through the warehouse. But what that does is it frees up space for us to uh, put some more high density utilization in. And when you, don't, you know, when you get organized, you get order integrity you know, um, it becomes much more uh, of a, a better flow. It's the old assembly line kind of thing. You're feeding the pickers, so you get more productivity and, and integrity in the orders. And we increase the picks per hour by doing that. And, uh, you know, when you do pick to light, what happens is the pick to light has a system within it where you can actually uh, monitor pickers and see who your best pickers are, who are the most productive, who do it correct all the time. And the pick to light um, actually provides 90, over 99% accuracy. So it, it really helps you back with those chargebacks. Thanks, John. And Danny? And having integrated the warehouse with the, with, the, with the enterprise software is very important because if you don't have it combined, warehouse and warehouse and in ERP to, they have broken lane, which create an inaccurate inventory. Another issue is implementing a, a module using a smartphone lowers the cost instead of a, a 400 smartphone replace a 3000 dollars gun. And implementation is very important. We, in order to avoid business disruption, we create a test environment where the data converts every day. When it's accurate, the user get trained in test environment and every department gets an expert assigned to it. So basically, it's a minimum business disruption, and you run your business while everything done in test environment. Thanks, Danny. And then I just want to comment, uh, EIG has over 50 partners, so if this is certainly a, a major part of your operations, but there's other parts of your operations that you may need support and sales, human resources, uh, other technology requirements outside of, of what we talked about today, we have other partners that focus on in, in those areas. So we're 
he, here to uh, act as a uh, a catalyst to synergize your your uh, your needs and to make sure that you prioritized overall from an annual operating plan perspective of what you're going to focus on in the next uh, 12 months, uh, all the way to how do you get hire the right staff for your requirements. So uh, that's what EIG offers outside of what we talked about today. But for today, it's, we, we really feel like this is a fast track, tailored VAI, ERP, MRP implementation aligned to your business capabilities and priorities. That's what our overall goal is. Uh, with that, uh, because of time, we're just going to keep moving into Danny's section on leashing the power of a unified database. Danny? That's a big issue companies face today when they don't have the right vendor. Lack of support is a huge issue. You, I can compare it to um, you get stuck on the car on the highway and it will take a mechanic 10 minutes to fix it, but you are stuck. Not having support is a major issue. Another issue is frequent upgrade. A lot of companies, software companies, buy other companies and don't, don't upgrade the software. So you end up paying license fee for outdated software. And that creates a real issue because you don't stay with the time. And the less and most, most the less and most important thing is slideshow demo. They give you a nice demo and you don't affect, you don't uh, address the business issues. I have a very large account now that we, we yesterday we did the fifth demo already. And they were going to buy after the first demo, but we told him we don't, every car between the showroom and every car and, and every demo is beautiful. You want your business requirement and your test data. And we became friends and the CEO and the key person invited me to the, to the, for the Hanukkah holiday to, to come to visit the house. <laughs> nice. That's in a nutshell, the entire VAI software is one-stop shopping. Analytic, not showing what your inventory is, accounting or the processing, sales, manufacturing, distribution, food, warehouse, CRM, e-commerce, mobile. It's basically the one-stop shopping on the single database, which is very, very important, especially in the M&A world. When distributed by a manufacturer, you end up with few ERP software which don't integrate, which we require access user user access efforts and corrupted data. In a nutshell, that's the whole thing. Unified database, streamlined operation, real time information, and inventory warehouse management is all part of the package. Thanks, Danny. With that, we did we do have a uh, a polling question here that uh, is kind of an interesting one. And where where did Black Friday originate? Uh, I wonder if uh, I think we did this guest uh, with the partners before. Was it New York City, Chicago, Philadelphia, or San Francisco? Uh, I know I thought it was Chicago. I was wrong. Danny, I think, Danny, you said New York City, is that right? Yes. And John, you said New York City? Yes. I, I was following my friend Danny. Yeah. So I we were all wrong. So the answer is Philadelphia, and it originated from the 1950s, the day after Thanksgiving, everybody rushing down to Philadelphia, and everybody's like... Um, thinking that's a vacation day, but it's not a vacation day if you're a cop because people got pretty unruly. If you remember the Cabbage Patch uh, dolls and and a couple of movies about how people went crazy on the day after Thanksgiving to get the best prices and the and the best toys. And, and it was actually the police force called it Black Friday <laughs> <laughs> because it was a Black Friday for them because they had to put in overtime and you know, people get pretty uh, weird, I think, uh, when they want to save a buck or two or 10% or 20%. So that's where Black Friday came from. Just a, a little bit to break up to today's uh, webinar. With that, we're, we'll, we'll move on to the next 
slide next area on case studies. And John will kick us off with uh, his case study here with the glassware company. It, 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 this is an eyewear company. These are the slides that you saw before. This is a three level pick module. Um, we uh, we put this in for them. They did fulfillment for all the major mass merchandisers who would sell sunglasses. And you know, one of the problems with that is that they do tag everything and put their own security on them. So they had to uh, segregate the uh, chains. You know, one of the things that I didn't mention before was that they also used a put system. You know, many of these mass merchandisers always use the same SKU or many of the same SKUs. So instead of a pick into a box in a pick module and then send it down the line, they would send the product down the line. And, you know, many of them roll out the same thing. They get 20 to, you know, the store in Cleveland, 20 to Cincinnati, 20, you know. And so what they would do is do it the opposite way and put a put ball in. And that's what they did here also. You know, it was one of the largest eyewear providers, it was located in New Jersey, um, had mass merchandisers all across the country. They would they would pick Walmart West one day, Walmart East another, so on and so forth. And we reduced shipping areas and fines and we increased their productivity. Um, one of the things we did, of course, is that we we when we put a system in, we do the design and engineering, which helped them increase their productivity and throughput. You know, orders were shipped in a timely manner and they were correct and complete. And uh, they had like 20% less chargebacks from merchandisers, which as Danny had mentioned before, was a profit center for a lot of the mass merchandisers. And they increased their productivity throughout the warehouse. So in, in this specific system, their ROI was less than one year. Thanks, John. Danny? This is the case study of a company that uh, had ma massive chargebacks, has multiple system, and they needed to consolidate the whole thing. They sold to the to the mass merchandise. You can see the Walmart, the club, and all of those, and they had a huge issue. So they have to analyze why they're having so much chargebacks, and how they become more friendly to the consumer and be able to buy it uh, and become more. Uh, productive. So what they've done, they did some, decide to do soul search and became to, came with a new direct, the board of directors decided to go with a new direction. And by using the VI system, they had the, the able to, to use the EDI efficiently, have a retail, the proof of delivery become more efficient by having, and by having single database software, they were able to do all those things in one place without having all those penalties, and they're much more profitable now. Great. The savings are one million dollar, eighty percent are are not touched. Now. It's all being done by accuracy by by uh, by by smartphones or RF gun or thing like that, and there is no more uh, human factor packing it. Well, one of the things that you notice there is they're using voice over picking. So instead of in like the pick module using pick the light, you can use a voice where they wear a headset and they don't have to uh they don't have to uh, use the gun and scan everything. So, you know, that that's something that uh, is something that can be available in that pick module that I showed you before also. Another thing about the voice is it's multiple languages. So if you hire people who are not, um, not uh, or immigrants or not, or we have big influx now, it's, it's multiple languages, Spanish or English or whatever languages, you can tell them, pick up those items in this location. I think it's up to seven different languages now, Dan. Nice. Yeah, and what I love about this case study is, is that they put the customer first. And everybody says it costs too much to serve the customer and to get, 100% on time. But here you can see their supplier scorecard went from 75% to 99.9% and they increased sales and it didn't cost them any money. They 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 had all the data in the system of S2K for years but they hadn't used it and they worked with VAI to uh hone in on this, you know, put the customer first and make it make us a friendly uh, to do business. So I often hear 
manufacturer says it cost us too much to deliver on time. It doesn't have to. Uh, and this is proof in the pudding, so to speak. Well, I think you see that quite often, Jim. You know, people have the capabilities, but if they don't use them correctly, you know, if they don't put in the right data and they don't use them correctly, it's not going to help them. Absolutely. I love this case study. <laughs> uh, Danny, the next this one. This is a case study of a perfume company that has a standalone, a standalone website and multiple ERP software and resulting in a excess labor, wrong shipment, and uh, all kind of Pandora box was happened there. So what will happen is getting the VAI, they start to, they're able to know what to buy, when to buy, how much to buy, and whom to buy. So the mistake will decrease substantially. And the main thing is the, the customers are happy, which is another thing. They ship worldwide now, and they went, they quadrupled the business by now by having efficient ERP software. They're, they come, they're a manufacturer and distributor and a wholesaler, so they have to have integrated, before they had few, few ERP software, they have integration issues. Now by using VI, one-stop shopping, which has distribution, manufacturing, and food, it's all in one under one umbrella, and it does have no integration issue to create the the mess they had before. And I love their saying there, right, Danny? VAI system is able to grow with us, or maybe VAI helped them grow beyond what they thought they could do. <laughs> they practically tripled the business since they bought. I I brought them in about eight years ago, and by now they've tripled the business since then. That's fantastic. So you can triple your business using technology. <laughs> Beautiful case study. All <laughs> right. So uh, we're uh, we're just trying to wrap up here. And uh, Danny, John, your thoughts on this slide? Uh, uh, first, uh, John. Yeah, on the uh, the automation impacts. You know, um, what what we're doing here is we're trying to and this trying to eliminate the chargebacks, trying to increase productivity by increasing accuracy and having higher throughput and using your space. And, and that ROI is typically a one-year return on investment. And when you take the automation that we can provide with the uh, with the ERP and WMS that VAI and Danny provide, you know, you're, you're getting a system where we will give you the hardware and the controls and Danny will provide the intelligence that will get you to that ROI for one year. Danny? Your factors are, factor number one is the uh, analytic, knowing what to buy, when to buy, and how much to buy. That creates a huge a huge difference on both ways. Number one, you don't have a, your cash tied in an inventory and the warehouse overstocked. Second, the second thing is have a reliable RF gun. Using a smart, sometime a smartphone would be a better choice than RF gun, but there is no given to it. But you have, so or the or the voice speaks. So you have good, a good option. And the third thing is having reliable, seamless integration between the warehouse and the ERP. Is that you can see huge location here. And multiple location is another issue. You must know what in each warehouse is. If you don't, if you have multiple ERP software, one warehouse is overstock, one is understocked, and you end up the understock buying more while the overstock has too much inventory. Having a real-time software over the cloud, you know what every software, every warehouse has inventory. ROI, we have clients to achieve a million dollar in one, like Imperial Dead, a million dollar ROI in one year. And Black River achieve a million dollar in two and a half years. Yeah, you have a lot of case studies. So, uh, Danny, I think you have the record number of case studies. If you can't find something similar to your business <laughs> on your website, I'd be surprised. So, a lot of information for both uh, AHS and and SMC data on how to improve your your facility to make it run better. So hopefully you enjoyed the webinar today and uh, we addressed uh, the deliverables uh, completely. And uh, we look forward to our webinar next month. 
uh, after the new year. We can say next year, we'll see you back here on Simplifying Warehouse Operations. And with that, John, any closing comments? I just want to thank everyone. I, th I thought it was a really uh, good discussion, and I hope uh, everyone enjoyed it. 